So let's let's get started about the town project. And uh, I actually had a couple of uh, the interesting discussions with some of you guys already, and the uh, the had some kind of a general uh, the the, uh, the uh, discussions uh, through the general discussions. I saw that it's good idea to share some of the kind of a uh, uh, important information where of how to kind of proceed with the research in general. So I just want to also share uh, some of the um, um, some of the kind of our uh, experimental design uh, for you guys. So first part, um, do science. So this is actually quite often happens. And I actually often actually ask this question to, to student, uh, other students. So student A, they actually do not finish any kind of new implementation, but they actually already finished the solid baseline. So what they can do is doing some new implementation and showing the improvement. Student B, they actually finish their a great ideas already implemented and get some experimental result. However, student B doesn't have any uh, benchmark baseline and so on. And the, the question, uh, the, which one is easy uh, personally, but which one is easy for me to actually guide them to, for example, uh, the lighter paper and so on. Yes, <laughs> yes. So that is a kind of my, one of my important messages. So let's do science. How we kind of improve our technologies. This is based on the comparison. Every time we compare and then getting a better result. And then, the, the, by the way, uh, the review system is also great. This also writes our kind of our result and so on. And then also publish it, publicize the result. We can compare them. And then other technologies are improved. So this is the science. So there are a lot of you know, uh, inventions are done by human being, uh, like you know, uh, the, the airplane or uh, Fourier transformer, <laughs> uh, computer architecture, whatever, uh, the, the relative theory, everything is very cool. But for me personally, the most important invention uh, by human is actually making this methodology of comparing something, which is very important. So even your super techniques are very cool. If you have only one number, uh, we actually cannot recognize your uh, the, the super cool technologies. So uh, this is actually one reason that we are the, are the stick you guys to focus on the getting a good benchmark, good baseline uh, in the, uh, the, the, uh, the first term project, uh, the, the deadline extended abstract in the next week. So for me, actually, if you guys have some kind of solid baseline to add what you want to do, it's very easy to guide you guys uh, to make some research. And again, the very difficult case is actually the some kind of, <laughs> Uh, the very cool baseline, uh, very cool implementation, but there's no kind of baseline. It's very difficult for me to actually guide. Yeah. So this is a uh, one important uh, the the uh, the the, the uh, suggestion. And the second one uh, is also kind of uh, important, but people tend to uh, the kind of uh, uh, the uh, the ignore this so uh, it sounds like very trivial but the, the people actually again tend to uh, the, the ignore so I just want to mention so doing some kind of new implementations or uh, the, some investigation and so on or debugging of course you do not have to use full data right so you just use a small portion of the data that is fine so this again sounds like you know very trivial, but many people actually stick to like for example, once you guys stick to you uh, started to use some data, you guys are very stick to this data and do not forget to for example reduce the size for the debugging or investigation and so on. So this is very important. Uh, the 
Unfortunately, unfortunately, our kind of problem it requires a lot of trial and error. And then to reduce a kind of uh, that, uh, the trial and error cycles by reducing the amount of data, and then you guys can have a more investigation, a more implementation, uh, the more trials for the debugging, and then later scale up. So this is actually quite uh, the, the, uh, the, the classical ways. So uh, the please uh, the also uh, remind uh, this approach is, for example, the ESP.NET recipe tutorial, we use AN4, right? And uh, this actually, even we can finish the training with the Google Cloud and the 20 minutes and so on. So this will be a probably a good example for you guys to just you know testing your implementation. Again, later are uh, the scale up to the other problems. Or sometimes you know uh, that if you guys uh, that, uh, find some kind of problem and then going back to do the deb debugging investigation, again I'm moving to a small data. The important part is to make the kind of cycle, experimental cycle, shorter, so that you guys can have a lot of trial and error. This is very important. Okay, uh, third topic is uh, visualization. Speech is actually not easy to visualize. Uh, we should actually listen sometime, but we could still visualize some of them. And uh, for me, too important uh, the, the visualization is the learning curve that you know, tells us a lot of kind of uh, information of uh, what your learning is going on that I mentioned in the previous lectures uh, the several times. I recommend you guys to kind of uh, the off monitor the learning curve. And the other uh, the, uh, good debugging part is attention weight. Attention weight is also very good uh, the, uh, the intuition uh, the, the, that we can get since it is probability. So it actually gives us the, the, uh, the more uh, interpretation. And also in our cases, we often mention that many cases actually attention weight should be diagonal. Uh, the, regardless of whether this is self-attention or uh, the, the uh, cross-attention, uh, mostly it is uh, the, the diagonal. So this is actually also good uh, the way to uh, the debug, uh, visualize what uh, you are doing. So uh, the, let's do it. Uh, and the next one is also, uh, actually this is one of the, how to say, uh, the, uh, the, the important debugging points in our app because it has a lot of actually uh, the, the mistakes happens uh, the, even for the mature researchers like a PhD student. So be careful about uh, a difference between the training and the evaluation mode. These are uh, the many of the implementation uh, that would be different, right? Especially the, uh, the like for example, dropout masking, model averaging. Uh, these are, are the not, uh, the, the, this is the not same behavior in the training and the inference. And the many of the mistakes I found is that the, I forgot to, for example, make it as an evaluation mode, or you guys make some kind of evaluation mode by yourself, and then making the masking or dropout to be uh, enable even in the inference stage. So this is a very typical error. So uh, the, uh, if you guys have some kind of, uh, the, the, yes, I am monitoring the learning curve. So this learning should be the, the correct. In this case, uh, please check about this kind of evaluation training difference. Another kind of important part is that the, for speech recognition, uh, the training and the evaluation, another difference is the, uh, the inference part, uh, the beam search part. During the training, we use a teacher forcing. So we don't have any beam force, uh, the beam search. While the, during the inference, uh, we actually using the, uh, the beam search. And then some of the beam search parameters can also be um, um, uh, the, 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 uh, the cause that kind of error, mismatch of the training and the other uh, the inference and uh, the performance. So please also check it. 
And it is actually related to this other, other training and evaluation model. Uh, but anyway, my experience, most buggy part uh, is padding, masking. So masking shape, masking value is always kind of uh, has some issues. So uh, the please remind that if there is some strange behavior, first I recommend you guys to actually check masking part. May, it's good to actually visualize a mask. Just print out a mask is important. Mask is usually 2D, so you can actually visualize it. And then if you insert a wrong parameters, which is also not good. And if it is combined with the, uh, the, uh, the uh, normalization and so on, this is also very bad. So uh, please carefully check the padding. Uh, I would say that the, uh, the usually your first kind of a mask uh, would be something wrong. So <laughs> definitely print out the mask uh, behave, uh, the, the shape and the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, mask element uh, to check it. And the next one is that I believe some of you guys are actually wo will work on the fine tuning, which is the most important uh, uh, the technologies now. And then, Again, the quite other often people make this kind of mistake. People unintentionally initialize fine tuning parameters. This uh, often happens. Uh, so that uh, the, uh, actually the people intended to use the fine tuning, but it turns out that it's actually flat start training. So, uh, I recommend you guys after the initialization was called uh, print out the, the parameter uh, so that the, uh, the parameters are there that not changed uh, or uh, it is initialized, you can check. And the last one uh, is uh, mostly people are working on a speech recognition. Uh, some people may use the classification but anyway, people can just checking the error or accuracy, which is not a great idea. So you can actually check uh, actual uh, ASR result, including, for example, the breakdown of the insertion deletion errors, and actually whether uh, this kind of uh, the fit sentence has uh, the, the causes some mistakes and so on. Uh, that is very important. So uh, the please uh, the, uh, the check the uh, breakdown of the word error rate uh, rather than just checking the uh, the uh, word error rate value only. Okay. And the next one, again, some people are working on the new data, which is very cool. Uh, that we should definitely do that. But the new data actually has a lot of issues since people do not touch. Or even you know the existing data, but people do not touch so much, and then uh, usually a lot of issues happen. Like for example, some cases the recording is super long. Uh, we should cut. Uh, we should remove this kind of uh, the, the long recording uh, and so on. And the data generally including a lot of noises. Noises here not only means the background noise and so on. Transcription should also be super noisy. You should actually think that the, the, uh, the always noise some exist in the database. And then the, the, uh, the most effective way uh, to check the kind of our uh, data is noisy or not, is that of course, you know, we can get correct some of the, uh, the, the uh, analysis, but then finally listen to the audio then uh, you can find that this data is either broken or this data is not aligned with the transcription and so on. You can easily find it. So uh, please try to also listen to some of the audio. And the other issue uh, is training and test data splits. This is actually not very known uh, after the end to end. So I just want to remark it. So even some famous database actually had this kind of mistakes. So after the end-to-end -end system, uh, the moving to the end-to-end -end system from HM-based system, decoder network, transducer, or 
added uh, attention, actually try to memorize the transcription completely. And then if, for example, training and test data have the exactly same transcriptions, then we actually uh, cannot know that uh, this uh, the ASR is recognizing speech or just using the language model. <laughs> so uh, this often happens. Of course, you know, a small portion of the sentences are completely overlapped, speech is fine. But if the sentences are, are, the, are the overlapped largely, and then if you train the model, probably your model will get the, like for example, the, the uh, 5% of the word error rate <laughs> easily, only with the, the 10 hours of training data. Probably in this case, uh, ASR is not working, but just a uh, decoder language model is, is memorizing the entire sentence. So uh, the, please check the kind of uh, training and the test data are uh, not overlap uh, in terms of transcription. Again, small overlap is fine, you know, the, the five percent and so on is fine, but it goes to like for, for 20 to 30 percent. Uh, we cannot fully really evaluate it. And the last is the uh, text normalization. Uh, this is actually quite annoying, uh, but the, let's try to make it consistent. At least if you guys make the uh, normalization consistent, that can be fine. Okay, so these are more like a general, how to say, experimental design and the general kind of uh, the data tips uh, that, that to uh, conduct uh, the cost uh, the term project. Uh, any questions or comments? Okay, sounds good. So again, if you guys have faced on some issues, please, you know, uh, the revisit this kind of item. And then, you know, uh, the, the, uh, you guys may actually solve the, the, a lot of issues by yourself. <laughs> Again, the, 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 uh, the uh, difference between training and evaluation model, padding, unintentional uh, initialization, visualization, uh, usually uh, the mostly solve your problems. Okay, sounds good. So uh, now I move to the uh, the uh, uh, the technical content. Uh, today, uh, the, I will uh, discuss about several uh, advanced topic on end-to-end -end ASR. So first, uh, the, I will uh, the, the, this start uh, from the summarization, a summary of the RN transducer versus CTC versus attention. And then I will move to uh, several techniques uh, developed in after the end-to-end -end ASR, which actually significantly improve the performance or sign significantly uh, the, uh, broaden uh, the application. So I want to kind of explain about these three topics, data augmentation, uh, multilingual ASR, and the semi-supervised learning. Okay, so let's uh, the, the review, uh, revisit uh, the summary of the RN transducer that I explained before, but mostly by combining, uh, comparing it uh, with CTC and attention. Yesterday, no, yesterday, uh, that Monday, I explained about that the uh, RN transducer and the CTC has a significant difference comes from the conditional independence assumption. And the which actually are, are making the performance to be uh, better in terms of the, uh, the, the RN transducers at uh, the word error rate. Although uh, CTC actually has a, uh, the simple, uh, the, the, uh, has a simplicity. So this actually has a pros and cons. And another important part is that Horridis is different. RN transducers Horridis is very flexible. So now we don't have our, any constraint about the length of the input and the output. For CTC, uh, length is very important. So again, uh, the, the, in your kind of a cost time project or in your kind of a, uh, the, uh, the time project, uh, the coding assignment, uh, the, please be careful uh, to make CTC to be working in the uh, 
normal condition. But due to this kind of a very large tolerance structure, uh, RN transistor tend to be more difficult to train than CDC. That is kind of a general behavior. And the RN transistor and the attention actually has a, 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 another kind of a issue compared with CTC, which is the teacher forcing. Since they actually uh, the, have to have a condition uh, of the token uh, in their kind of modeling, during the training, they use the ground truth uh, correct history, while during the inference, they use the estimated one. So it actually has a mismatch. So this actually also the cause some kind of significant other performance uh, the, the, the difference uh, during training the inference. So we should actually be careful about not to overturn the model of the RN transducers and the attention based ASR in terms of this other teacher forcing perspective. And uh, I also mentioned that the tolerance structure is not uh, unique. Uh, there are a lot of actually uh, the uh, the study uh, about the tolerance structure of the RN transducer. So if you, you guys are also interested in that, the check some of the papers that I listed here. And I try to kind of uh, write that RN transducer and the attention in the similar picture. So as you can see that actually these two structures are very similar, right? First, uh, the encoder part is taking the uh, 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 entire observation the same. And the uh, decoder also having an autoregressive uh, mode, which kind of uh, the input previously previous token history, and then getting the hidden state. And after that, uh, the, we, in our instances, uh, it is joint model, but the, in the, uh, the attention cases, it becomes cross attention. And there are another difference is that uh, the, uh, the uh, RN transducer, this token prediction part is uh, the multiple layers, but joint modeling part is only one. While uh, the, the uh, attention, especially the uh, transformer, it's actually cross attention happens that the, uh, the several layers. But basically, high level uh, the architecture is quite similar. But the difference is actually this part. So attention actually uh, the, use the entire information of the encoder. So this is actually very good in terms of we get the more information, especially if we can get the kind of future information that is very useful. So in this regard, attention would be uh, the there are some discussion, but uh, my experience in general, actually attention is slightly better than RN transducer due to the kind of information uh, of using the entire encoder information to uh, the, the use of this kind of uh, the, uh, input and output token information. However, RN transducer actually only using the, this uh, the, uh, the time information and then getting the output for each input frame. So this means that we can actually providing the information, speech recognition result for each input token, uh, sorry, each input frame, uh, so that we can actually make uh, the, the RN transistor to be easily uh, the extended to the online or streaming manner, while uh, the attention actually don't have uh, this kind of information time information anymore, since we aggregate all information here. So that in general, it is not easy to uh, the, uh, get the kind of our online property of the attention uh, based on this kind of a nature uh, in 
in general. Of course, there are a lot of ways to make the attention to in other, other providing the uh, uh, inherit the information of the uh, timestamp uh, in the input. But this is a general behavior. Okay, so uh, let's talk more about this kind of a function of the RN transducer. As I mentioned that the RN transducer keeping the input frame information in the final output. And then actually we can make uh, the RN transducer to be fully causal easily. How to do it? We just try not to use the future frame, okay? And then this uh, the, the network actually becomes fully causal. And then fully causal means that we don't have to wait uh, for uh, the, the getting some kind of our, uh, the, uh, speech data. As soon as we get the, the, the speech data, we can actually providing the results since it's fully causal. So this approach is called streaming. And the RN transfers are actually naturally easily uh, realized for this kind of streaming. By the way, CTC can also do it. The issue is attention. Attention is aggregating all the information. So attention actually requires some extension, uh, like uh, making the attention to be monotonic or making the attention to be blockwise. And then uh, we try not to use the entire frame. By doing that, we can also make attention to be causal. Uh, but right now, actually, uh, the RN transfer way is more simple, so that many of the product system actually using RN transfer. So this is a kind of a summary, uh, or I would say that the current trend of the RN transfer. Um, it's actually used for many products uh, due to the kind of streaming property and also getting the better performance than CTC. So due to that, uh, the, the, uh, many actually, uh, the product are uh, the, the using RN transfer, that is kind of a current situation. However, actually this is just one or two year. So for the, the, my kind of uh, the, uh, the experience, the trend will be changing. <laughs> so for example, uh, the initially CTC, was the kind of uh, the, the most kind of popular end-to-end -end system. And then due to the kind of uh, a performance issue, people switch to attention. And due to the kind of uh, online uh, the, the streaming issue, people switch to RN transistor. But not sure uh, next uh, the feature architecture will be. For example, I'm actually very excited about the recent improvement of the CTC. So actually not only uh, the, the, the me, but the many of other groups are actually revisiting CTC and try to even replace CTC, uh, replace the RN transfer to CTC. This also happened. And uh, should we then uh, leave attention uh, the, uh, as a kind of a uh, the side model? Actually not. Attention uh, just for speech, uh, just using the speech as a real-time interface, uh, the, yes, streaming is very important. However, speech processing has a lot of application, lot of offline application as well. And also uh, the speech application has a lot of uh, the connection to the downstream NLP task. And this, that NLP task usually actually uh, not monotonic. So we couldn't actually use RN transducer or CTC uh, the straightforward manner. So in this case, actually attention is, has been uh, widely used. Instead of uh, the using CTC and RN transducer to extend to uh, deal with, for example, uh, the speech recognition and the machine translation, which is speech translation, uh, many speech translation people are actually working on attention and then try to make your attention to be streaming. So uh, this kind of a trend uh, can be changed, uh, but right now uh, the, for speech recognition researchers, RN transducer is a quite uh, a big trend. 
Okay, so that's the, about the, the RN transducer and also summarizing all three kinds of architecture, CTC, uh, attention, RN transducer. Uh, any questions, comments uh, the, about this? Okay, sounds good. Then the, I will move to the, uh, the some kind of our, uh, uh, the, uh, the independent topic for uh, the, the, uh, the attention, uh, the end-to-end -end ASR uh, to improve the performance or to further uh, the, the, uh, the make end-to-end uh, uh, -end ASR system to be flexible. So first part is the data augmentation. So uh, the data augmentation is uh, widely used in speech processing even before the deep neural network error because speech has a lot of variations. I just listing the noise room impulse response and the speaking style, but of course we have even more, right? Uh, the speech can also be changed by the speaker, emotion, uh, the uh, uh, longer context, uh, and so on. So speech actually has a lot of variations. But a particularly important uh, when we use speech recognition in the real system, uh, the, uh, uh, which is the, the too robust to the noise and room impulse response. And the noise would be uh, the, the, uh, quite large, right? Probably infinite <laughs> uh, the, uh, the kinds of number of uh, the, the, the kinds of noises uh, that the, the exist in our world. So, and the room impulse response as well, uh, changing the room, changing the temperature, uh, then the completely uh, the room impulse response would also be changed. So uh, the, it is very difficult to cover all the kind of such kind of variation. So this is very difficult problem if we just are uh, collecting the data and so on. However, we are very lucky. Speech is sound, speech is a physical signal, speech is a, a wave. So we actually know the propagation equation. And we actually can actually model the room impulse response and the noise with this kind of a simple form, convolution and addition to uh, generate a kind of a noisy and a reverberate speech. Then the, the, uh, the how to kind of augment the speech data, we just correcting a lot of room uh, impulse response. This uh, can be actually made, made by simulator. We just uh, use a simulator, and then we just are uh, using a lot of kind of room sizes or the deflection uh, the questions and so on. By doing this kind of uh, variation, we can actually generate a lot of, lot of uh, the room impact response. And the noise, again, it is not so difficult to record it, noise, right? Uh, we can, it's difficult to uh, record uh, speech and the corresponding transcription, but just recording noise is not super difficult. And we actually have a lot of uh, the corrections of the uh, noise, noise corpus. So we could also use this kind of information. And then we collected a lot of room impulse response. We collected a lot of noise, noise information. And then uh, the, the, from the, uh, the, the original speech to generate noisy reverberant speech as many as possible. Uh, that is the kind of our most uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, powerful uh, data augmentation technique. So actually, um, this is often I uh, the, the, the people in Google uh, the pointed out uh, that to me. So I also want to emphasize um, the robust speech recognition, noise, uh, the, the, uh, noisy speech recognition uh, that has been studied uh, uh, for very long history. And many people actually uh, the propose super uh, the cool techniques and so on. And actually, uh, the, after the Thanksgiving, 
uh, we will have a uh, one guest lecture uh, the, from John Chu Wan. Uh, he is actually one of the, uh, the most active speech enhancement separation researcher. And he will talk about you know, the state of the art speech enhancement separation technique, which is very, very cool. And then model itself is also advanced by using a lot of technologies and so on. However, the most important technique to launch our kind of system to the uh, real uh, the, the product is actually this data augmentation. So when Google uh, launched Google Home, the most biggest uh, the, the performance gain actually came from uh, this data augmentation. Later, they do a lot of research and then you know providing a very cool other uh, fancy uh, technique on top of this kind of data augmented uh, models. But the big gain actually came from the data augmentation. Okay, uh, let's uh, the play some of the audio. Hope it would work. A word should be said here of the title of Dante's autobiography. And the noise is this one. <laughs> Um, water sound. <laughs> I just pick up from the free sound and the noise B. Some jungle, I don't know. <laughs> and then how to do the data augmentation? We're just adding, right? A word should be said here. I don't know if out of my this situation may happen in the home scenario, right? <laughs> and uh, we actually also often control the, uh, the uh, SNR because the other situation, SNR is very important. I think that uh, the half part is already gone, right? It's very difficult task. And then uh, the the other cases. Well, this situation may also happen, you know, if we, you know, call your friend uh, in the zoo. So <laughs> the data augmentation technique is actually providing the wider variation of your kind of a speech program. And the last kind of important uh, the data augmentation technique is actually changing the speed of the voice, which is corresponding to changing the speaking style, or even actually changing the pitch and so on. But anyway, let's uh, the play the clean one. A word should be said here of the title of Dante's autobiography. And then changing the speed. A word should be said here of the title of Dante's autobiography. Uh, this is actually uh, reducing the speed, uh, the 0 0.8 or something like that. This is still speech, right? And audible. And uh, it's actually uh, uh, the important technique to uh, the augment the data. So these are more like a, uh, the classical data augmentation, I would say, people are using. But after uh, we move to the neural network, especially after the end-to-end -end, uh, ASR, uh, the, there is a kind of a big innovation, uh, which called the spec augment. Uh, this is actually quite simple, but very powerful. Uh, from here to here, you could see that we actually inserting the mask here, right? So this, how to say, uh, the, the line mask applying to the, uh, the frequency and the time axis was uh, the, actually quite powerful uh, the, to uh, improve the speech, uh, the recognition performance. And actually, in these cases, uh, the hyperparameter is this widths, for example. It can be wider or shorter, uh, depending on the hyperparameter. Same for this, uh, the, the frequency, uh, the widths. And then how often we apply. But basically, after that, we actually randomly uh, the process uh, this uh, the data augmentation. Yeah, yeah. Frequency domain skip is more like, you know, some kind of a special distortion may happen. However, uh, for me, 
this is more like a, uh, the, a kind of a dropout to me. Uh, instead of uh, the interpreting uh, this one as some kind of actual spectral uh, the, the, the property. So especially, yeah, this one is not easy for me to actually interpret because this doesn't happen except for we use a very crazy codec. Uh, but still it's very powerful. But for me, I am understanding this other, you know, the data level dropout. And it's also very structured uh, based on the line, uh, the, the structure, uh, so that the, the actually training becomes quite regularized. So I will show you the actually example. So this is actually one of the, uh, the our uh, the notebook, N4 result. And the left one is uh, the normal training. And the right one is actually performing the spec augment. And the, yeah, in terms of the performance in this task, we didn't get a significant improvement, but you can see a very different behavior the most important behavior is that the training and the validations actually cross. So this means that, that we actually avoid to have an overtraining. This one is actually from here, we have a very significant uh, overtraining. But by using the spec augment, we can actually mitigate the overtraining issues. So my experience are the, uh, what is a good learning curve? It's actually keeping the, how to say, training and the variation to be in the similar trend uh, the, the, as much as possible. Do not overtrain, do not undertrain. <laughs> uh, this is a kind of a, uh, the ideal uh, the training uh, based on my experience. And the spec augment actually can uh, the, the, the do this kind of a control easily uh, based on that. And the spec augment together with uh, uh, the special optimization, actually, uh, by the way, one another uh, the difference of the normal training and spec augment is that we actually require more de more epochs. Let's say two times or three times more epochs uh, the, to be converted. So actually uh, the Google people are the first uh, the, uh, the realizing this uh, spec augment based on the LSTM. It takes very long time. So it is actually difficult for us to actually the, 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 uh, reproduce their results. So uh, this is another reason that, that our group uh, started with the transformer. And then actually with uh, the transformer together with this uh, the spec augment and the, uh, the, uh, the, the warm up optimizer and the model averaging, uh, we can actually uh, the, the get a quite significant improvement uh, that Google guys obtained with our kind of a consumer GPUs. But anyway, this performance improvement is kind of a, uh, the super significant, right? Yeah. This is the most uh, the, the, the extreme case, but in general, we could get the, uh, 10 to 20% relative improvement uh, by using spec augment. So spec augment is actually becomes uh, a quite a uh, standard technique. And the, together with the data simulation uh, based on the, uh, the noisy speech uh, the, or room impasse response generation, uh, data augmentations are, I would say, that the important uh, technique, uh, the essential technique for us to make speech recognition to be working robustly. Okay, this is the data augmentation part. Uh, any questions or comments? So again, coding assignment for probably you guys can also try uh, the spec augment. Uh, it will get some good performance gain. Okay, next is the, the uh, more for the application side. After the end-to-end -end ASL, uh, actually we can uh, make the speech recognition to be uh, the, uh, the used for many of the application easily. And I will explain how it is easily done. So before moving to that, I just want to uh, the, introduce my personal experience. Really apologize <laughs> for my personal experience. Um, 
I am Japanese, and uh, I always uh, try to kind of improve the Japanese ASR system first. And actually, Japanese uh, the language is not easy uh, for speech recognition. I say was not easy for speech recognition in general. So first, I think uh, that uh, this is same for the uh, other uh, the East Asian languages. We basically don't have a word boundary. So we actually don't have a word concept. Even we don't have a word concept. <laughs> uh, for the noun, we have a word concept, but uh, I'm not very sure about the others. Uh, we have a, a word, uh, the, the, the clear word concept. Depending on the linguistics, uh, the, I think it's same as the, the other countries, I believe. Japan, uh, depending on the linguist, actually word boundary is different. <laughs> because we don't have such kind of a clear definition. And in Japan, uh, due to the kind of historical reason, we actually using the at least three scripts mixed together. And since we also uh, started to use Roman alphabet, so now I'd say that four scripts are mixed. I guess you guys somehow recognize the, the alphabet here, right? By the way, this a little bit kind of a, a, a sparse character is called the katakana. And this uh, the dense character is actually uh, the, the originally from the Chinese, uh, but anyway, we call it kanji uh, character. And we actually have uh, another uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, script uh, that is uh, the, the also the, the showing the kind of uh, the, the uh, syllable information. So, so we basically using the four script, mixed four script with no word boundary. And the another issue is that the pronunciation, pronunciation of the each character, especially kanji character, uh, at least has a two pronunciations. And these two pronunciations are completely different. One came from the, the ancient uh, the Chinese and the other uh, came from the original Japanese. And just meaning the same. So we just using the same character and putting a different pronunciation, completely different. For example, this character in the, uh, the original, uh, we have a two uh, the pronunciation for this character. Uh, one is uh, originally came from the, uh, the Chinese, uh, the probably very different from current Mandarin. But anyway, that is she. Uh, we uh, the pronounce it this one, she. And in Japanese pronunciation, we pronounce it as a kokorozashi. <laughs> so different. <laughs> Just one character has a very different. And the, we actually, again, don't have any clue. Depending on the context, we are say changing this kind of a shi or a kokorozashi. Uh, the, so uh, that is actually quite uh, the, the difficult uh, for computer to realize it. And another is, uh, actually, uh, the, yeah, this one is uh, the, also showing another example. Each character may have a very different uh, the, the pronunciation uh, duration. Uh, for example, this one is only one phony. Mm. And again, this one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10 uh, the, the pronunciations only for the one character. So uh, the, this, uh, the, the, uh, the recognizing this uh, the, the, uh, the sentence is actually sounds like super difficult, right? Mix the script, uh, the pronunciation is completely different. We don't have a word boundary. Uh, and then before end to end, how to kind of process this data? we actually using a super sophisticated tokenizer, which actually can jointly solving this many to many pronunciation and the chunking at the same time. So actually uh, the Japanese uh, the tokenizer has a lot of uh, the, the history. And uh, actually one of the first approach that's using the, uh, the, uh, the SVM and CRF, uh, the machine learning techniques. Uh, because otherwise we cannot actually make it work. So uh, the, 
anyway, when we kind of recognize Japanese speech, uh, we actually have a tight collaboration with the NLP researchers and asking them to uh, create a super cool uh, tokenizer. And then we can somehow realize the other the, the speech recognition. So tokenizer is actually, again, not, uh, this is uh, the, the, this sentence, and this is the output. Tokenizer is not only, how to say, uh, the uh, split the, uh, each, uh, the, the, uh, the sentence to the each kind of a word. It's actually providing the pronunciation, providing the part of speech tagging, and so on. So uh, solving the chunking, uh, the pronunciation, and the part of speech tagging jointly. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, the, we actually cannot well, how to say, providing the uh, pronunciation of the correct pronunciation of the Japanese uh, the, the, uh, sentence. Uh, because if we change the tokenizer, uh, if we change the kind of position of the token, uh, segmentation is different. And then actually pronunciation will be also different. And if the part of the speech is different, uh, then actually pronunciation would also be different. So we have to jointly solve this kind of uh, the tokenization, uh, the pronunciation, and the part of the speech tagging at the same time. So, but with this kind of a great tool, uh, the Japanese ASR is what actually uh, the developed. Uh, the, but uh, this is actually quite a big uh, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, barrier uh, for uh, the many researchers. Uh, my kind of frequent question uh, that I got from the, uh, the other, uh, the, uh, researchers in the other country is that uh, how to <laughs> pronounce it speech recognition of the, uh, how to kind of uh, the realize the speech recognition of the, uh, the Japanese. Uh, and then I need to provide, for example, this tokenizer, let's use this tokenizer and let's use this syllable. And then let's using this kind of uh, the ASR system and so on. So it is very, very complicated. So uh, the, it, my actually, one of my research goal was actually removing a tokenizer. Try to kind of uh, the, the directly uh, the converting the speech signal to this kind of complicated uh, for a uh, mix of the four syllable. That is my kind of one of my dream. However, all this problem actually can be solved by using an end-to-end -end system. First, let's stop to uh, the consider the tokenization. We just using the uh, character. And the second, uh, uh, the, regardless of whether it's actually pronounced some, uh, anything, we just directly try to predict this mixed for script. So end-to-end -end system, we don't need uh, the intermediate phoneme, phone the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, layer, right? So we actually can make it. Okay, so pronunciation has a many-to-many -many other mapping. It is very difficult. But again, we skip the pronunciation part. We directly uh, predicting the, uh, the, the, from the speech to the, uh, this kind of uh, the, the, the token uh, directly. So we can actually internally asking a neural network to do it, but uh, the explicitly we try not to uh, the solve this one. So this is my actually trial. I actually, uh, the, after I uh, the, the first implemented the um end-to-end -end ASR system together with my colleagues uh, in 2016, I actually applied uh, uh, this other uh, end-to-end ASR system at, least at that time attention to the uh, Japanese uh, the, the system. And then we actually got a surprisingly good result. This is 2016 and we get the, uh, the character error is 10% without using any tokenizer. Uh, that was actually very kind of a, a surprising experience to me. Again, I was not expecting that this, how to say, dream <laughs> of removing a tokenizer uh, will, will kind of be, uh, come through. But actually, uh, the, in my kind of early research career, I actually uh, passed one of the <laughs> research goals. So that is very exciting. By the way, with you know conform and uh, whatever, now that it goes to five percent of uh, the character error rate, the Japanese is actually turned out to be easy languages. 
And the, pro, the, the I believe that I am the, our group is the first group that performing the uh, speech recognition of the Japanese system uh, without using the tokenizer. So this actually experience at, uh, also uh, the hit uh, me a lot of kind of our, uh, the interesting uh, ideas. Again, as I mentioned that Japanese actually is a mix of the several scripts, but I can use one single model to deal with this kind of mix of the script. So this means that we may probably using only single model to apply it to the multilingual speech recognition or even code switching. That is given my uh, the motivation, uh, experience of this one, uh, that I kind of setting the, the goal to uh, the, the realizing the multilingual end-to-end uh, -end ASR. But here, we just try to use a single model. So for example, before uh, the, uh, this kind of methodology happened, what people are doing is that the people usually actually making a speech recognition system for each language. Of course, some part can be shared, like a feature extraction. Some of the acoustic modeling part can be shared. But generally, uh, the, the people actually building speech recognition depending on the language. And they, given my kind of experience in the Japanese uh, ASR, what I want to do is actually, I try to use this as a single neural network. And how I uh, realized it is that it's uh, actually quite uh, the, the, uh, simple. We just mix all the data. That's it. Um, and uh, I even didn't care so much about the pronunciation or uh, anything. Even I, I actually don't know uh, the, the, the pronunciation of the other language than uh, Japanese and English. The only thing I did was actually uh, the, the, uh, the, the also uh, the, 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 the uh, inspired by the ma neural machine translation, we actually put the language tag in the beginning, like this, in the beginning of the sentence. That's it. Uh, by doing that and then train that, uh, the, the, we try to kind of uh, realize speech recognition, single speech recognition system to uh, the, uh, the, uh, recognize the, the, the multiple languages. So uh, this is a kind of experimental result. It's surprisingly working well. Um, there are 10 languages, Chinese, English, Japanese, German, Spanish, French, Italian, and, uh, the, this Dutch, Russian, Portugal. Yeah. Actually, uh, this uh, blue one is the language dependent. We made our ASR system for each language. And the, that one is mixing everything. And uh, actually, most of the cases that uh, uh, mixing is working better than the, uh, the, uh, the main system, uh, uh, depending on the language. The biggest reason is that since each language doesn't have uh, so many data, so it's actually the each language actually is not well trained, over trained. But by mixing all the data, we at least have a 10 times more data, right? And at least the encoder part is completely shared. Encoder part is more like doing a kind of a, a acoustic modeling. So due to this kind of a, a regularization issue, uh, the mixing all the kind of a, a language is uh, uh, surprisingly working. And we actually get a significant improvement. And I also mentioned that it's actually using the language tag here. So this system first pro uh, producing the language tag, which means that first we predict the language ID and then corresponding uh, the, the transcription of that language is following. So we can actually also uh, use this one as a language identification uh, the system. And we can also actually compute the language, uh, the identification performance. 
and actually almost are the correct. Uh, there are some kind of exception, like uh, Spanish and Italian are some similarity. And I was very excited about this kind of result. And then I also uh, apply this one to the little bit low resource uh, languages. Uh, uh, here, I actually don't know any of the uh, languages. Uh, it's some of them are low resource. Uh, some of them are high resource or middle resource. Uh, but it's not majorly studied in speech uh, recognition area. So th this is an important part. I don't know any of these languages, but I can build this ASL system. Um, sounds like amazing, right? Um, maybe, maybe you guys are not so much impressed uh, because you guys, you know, after the end to end, so just a pair data, you guys can make an end to end ASL system. So that you guys may have a common sense that you guys do not have to know about languages. But before that, uh, HM based system, we at least have to have uh, the, the, uh, make a kind of pronunciation dictionary, uh, the, uh, the extracting some web or some resources and so on. We actually have to have a knowledge about each language to build it. But this one, we actually don't use any kind of other language uh, knowledge. Well, I did know a little bit about, you know, uh, the Cantonese because, you know, Cantonese are the characters are similar to Japanese kanji. So I could know that, uh, I could uh, find that, but uh, I actually can not know any other kind of uh, the language. By the way, this one is actually at a, at a uh, it is a kind of a Unicode issue uh, the <laughs> converting what failed. <laughs> yeah, even computer is confused about this language. <laughs> but, uh, but I can give the control system, yes. Okay, so uh, this is a kind of uh, the multi extension. And the, the other extension of what I did was code switching. Um, what I did was with, with my colleagues, uh, the, and just the data, uh, the, the just concatenate the data of the different language, English, Japanese, German, concatenate, and then train it. And there is kind of a, uh, the, the, how to say, language boundary, so that you know, uh, the, the system can recognize uh, the uh, the uh, boundary of the language, and then could do some code switching. So this is uh, the result. This is without you know doing such kind of simulation and the code switching, and actually high error comes from the basically the system cannot handle the code switching. But by using this kind of simulation to uh, the, the imitate the code switching data, uh, we actually get a significant improvement. Although it's still uh, the the uh, I, uh, error side, but uh, the, this kind of uh, methodology uh, seems to be working. And this one is a bit kind of uh, the uh, toy uh, the problem, but I just want to show you the, some of the simulation example. And uh, this one is the difference uh, mixing uh, Portuguese, uh, German, Japanese. Uh, and then uh, this is the ASR result, and this case is actually completely co correct. So, like this kind of uh, the entire uh, the, uh, the sentence is mixed with the three languages, uh, ASR system actually change, uh, the detect this kind of language change. And correctly recognizing the the other uh, uh, speech, so that is kind of uh, the dumb again just uh, mixing the data. And the uh, this other uh, multilingual direction was has actually quite uh, the, the big uh, the uh, direction uh, for the uh, the other uh, uh, the problem like endangered language. Uh, the low resource language and so on. Uh, for example, some of the endangered low resource languages, 
we actually don't have uh, enough information about that language, but we luckily may have a uh, speech and corresponding transcription. And then uh, we could actually using the end-to-end ASR. Uh, and then we can actually transcribe that kind of speech. So it's actually uh, done by one of the uh, TA here, uh, the Jotun, uh, the, by applying the end-to-end -end SR system uh, to the, uh, the endangered language in the Mexican uh, the local uh, the, uh, language. And then this language is actually almost uh, the, how to say, no text, no script. So we have some script, that, that language has some script, but it comes from the kind of a, some other IPA form or Spanish. So they didn't have a own their kind of script. So they actually borrow this kind of a, a, a script. So this means that the linguist can actually write it, but the many the normal uh, people actually cannot even write this kind of text. And the transcribing is the more difficult. But by using this kind of a speech recognition system, uh, we learn this kind of law and so on uh, the implicitly in the system and actually making the system to be some level same with the kind of beginner of the, transcri uh, the, the, the transcriber. Okay, so the, the last part of this uh, the action is that the I kind of explained, uh, quickly explained about the, the uh, language ID part. I just put in the language ID and then, uh, you know, uh, the uh, speech recognition system is first detecting language and then the, the corresponding uh, the, the uh, token is followed. So this other uh, methodology is actually quite powerful. This other uh, methodology token augmentation is actually simple but powerful. We just expanding the vocabulary to include this kind of a special symbol. And then uh, we can just uh, the making it at a one sequence, okay? After we make a one sequence, we can actually add uh, making a SR system, which actually generating not only for the text, but also this kind of tag. So language ID is a one example, and we could actually using the many kind of these approaches, speaker ID, uh, the, the uh, dialect ID, or whatever. Uh, we can actually adding this kind of our other ID token uh, information, and then enrich our kind of our other ASR result, not only for the transcription, but other, other adding a, a lot of kind of our information about it. And this methodology is actually further uh, extended. Uh, one of the uh, important speech recognition tasks is spoken language understanding. That is not only recognizing the speech, but we try to understand the intention of the user and then providing some solution. Like for example, people say hi, oh, this is just a greeting. So system also may kind of, dialogue system may also, you know, respond hi. And they were asking what the weather. And then uh, the, uh, the intention of this kind of uh, the, the token uh, the is weather query, right? And this weather understand intention and then providing the information of the weather. This is a kind of spoken dialogue system. So to do that, we actually have to recognize uh, the, this other uh, intention tag. And of course, we also should also uh, recognize uh, the, the uh, transcription as well. How to jointly modeling it? We just concatenate it. And then we can actually realizing speech recognition and spoken language understanding at the same time. By the way, all of this kind of methodology uh, that in this kind of section, multilingual is uh, the, the code switching, uh, the, uh, the language identification and the speech recognition joint modeling, speak ID, direct ID, possibly with a joint modeling, ASR spoken language understanding, joint modeling. We didn't change the model at all. 
we ch didn't change the model architecture at all. We just changing the data, data preparation, and then realizing this kind of a various task. So this is another kind of very core uh, part uh, of this end-to-end uh, -end ASR. So just by changing the data preparation, we can customize our model to do some kind of our other interesting task. So you guys may come up with other you know, cool idea, but the, uh, the not just you know, changing the architecture, just changing the data preparation, you can realize such kind of cool idea. So this is actually very uh, nice part of the end-to-end uh, -end SR to broaden the application easily just by using the data preparation. Intention tag, just adding language tag, just adding speaker tag, that's it. Uh, there are a lot of, by the way, discussion for you know, where we insert and so on. This actually had a lot of uh, research at the question. Uh, but I just want to mention that the, the, uh, the end to end system can actually make a lot of uh, the, the uh, task jointly solved by just changing the data preparation. So, okay, uh, that's it, and uh, I'll see you in the next week. Thank you.